Hello history lovers and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be talking about Anne Stanley, the Countess of Castlehaven, who also had the nickname of Queen of the Cotswolds. She was also named as a potential heir to Queen Elizabeth I. And technically, she did have a better claim than King James VI of Scotland. As always, the sources for this video will be listed in the description box. And if you're new here, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And let's jump into the video. Anne Stanley was born on the 16th of July, 1581. And she was the eldest daughter of Alice Spencer and Ferdinando Stanley, the Earl of Derby. Through her father, Anne was a descendant of King Henry VII. Her great-great-grandmother was Mary Tudor, the youngest daughter of King Henry VII and Queen Elizabeth of York. This little factoid also meant that according to King Henry VIII's Act of Succession, she had a better claim than King James VI of Scotland, as her claim came through Mary Tudor. Henry had prioritised his younger sister's line over his older sister Margaret's line, which is how James got his claim to the English throne. Anne was joined by her younger sister Frances on the 1st of May 1583, and their final sibling, Elizabeth Stanley, was born in 1587. Unfortunately, I don't have a date of birth for her, only a date. Anne's father, Ferdinando, inherited the Earldom of Derby in 1593. A year later, he became Lord Lieutenant of Lancaster. However, he did not hold this position long as he died on the 16th of April, 1594, leaving a 34-year-old Alice a widow and his daughters Anne, Francis and Elizabeth were 14, 12 and 7. Six years later, in 1600, Anne's mother Alice would wed for a second time to Thomas Egerton. John Chamberlain wrote to Dudley Carlton on the 21st of October that same year, We have a constant report that the Lord Keeper shall marry, or as some say, hath married, the Countess Dowager of Derby, on St Luke's Day last. God send him good luck. From this account, we get the impression that Alice Stanley, Dowager Countess of Derby, was not a woman to be trifled with. And there is more evidence to support this the closer you look at her life. However, we are here to look at her daughter Anne, who seemed to have inherited her mother's tenacity. Alice and Thomas's marriage was far from a happy one, as it was filled with fights and unpleasantries. Fortunately for Alice, Thomas Egerton would die in 1617. 1601 was the year of marriages, as Anne's sister Elizabeth wed Henry Hastings, Earl of Huntingdon, on the 15th of January, and later that year, her other sister Frances married their stepbrother, John Egerton, the son of Thomas. Now, personally, I find it a bit odd that Anne wasn't found a marriage first, as it was the custom that the eldest daughter would be found a match before the younger siblings. This is one of the reasons that people put forward that Mary Boleyn was the elder sibling of Anne Boleyn, rather than the other way around. However, it may have been down to societal changes why Anne was not found a husband before her sister. After all, at this point we are edging closer to the end of the Tudor period and more into the Stuart era. Or it could be that Anne, as the eldest daughter and the one that has the most to inherit, that they were holding off waiting for a grander match for their prize of a daughter. In the same year that the youngest Stanley sister was getting hitched, discussions were happening at court around the marriage between Anne Stanley and the Prince of Muscovy, or Muscovy, Muscovy. In the autumn of that year, Queen Elizabeth I sent a letter to the Emperor of Muscovy explaining that, Hereof we did command our ambassador to speak, we being persuaded that there might have been a convenient marriage between the Prince, your son, and one of the daughters and heir of our cousin, the Earl of Derby, being of our blood royal, and of greater possessions than any subject within our realm. But having now to our great grief understood upon inquiry that your son is not above thirteen years of age, 
which is almost five years under that lady's age. This letter is evidence of Elizabeth planning on using her relatives as bargaining chips in the game of European politics, much like she would have done to the younger Grey sisters had they not gone off and secretly wed men below their stations. This also helped to steer away from the glaringly obvious fact that now Elizabeth was too old to bear children and that she herself had not made an advantageous marriage match. However, the failure of this royal match meant that Alice Stanley had to secure a suitable husband for her eldest and richest daughter and co-heiress. Alice would eventually find a match for her daughter Anne and the man would be Grey Bridges, Lord Chandos. The two would wed sometime before 1607. Grey was one of four, and was the only boy out of his parents' four children. Grey Bridges, Baron Chandos of Sudley Castle, was described as King of the Cotswolds, and the pair appeared to have lived in luxury. However, it was said that Anne would spend extravagantly? I mean, she was royalty by blood, so it doesn't surprise me. Anne and Grey would split their time between the countryside and the Jacobean court, and the couple would go on to have six children, five of whom would survive to adulthood. Elizabeth, George, William, Francis and Anne. On the whole, Anne and Grey had a cohesive relationship. However, on the 10th of August 1621, Grey Bridges suddenly died when he was abroad in Europe. Anne was left a widow at the age of 40, with young children and an income of £800 a year. Anne would remain a widow until 1624, when she wed the Earl of Castlehaven, on the 22nd of July at the age of 44. The marriage raised more than a few eyebrows, mainly because of his Irish title, his Catholic sympathies, and his scandalous sister, who was banned from court for her eccentric prophecies. And he was Anne's junior by 13 years. His father, George Touche, Lord Audley, which was an English title, the Earl of Castlehaven was an Irish title, just in case you didn't know. Despite his Irish title, he hailed from a prestigious English family, but spent much of his life in Ireland due to his military and political career. His mother, Lucy, was the daughter of Sir James Mervyn. The situation grew more intricate when Anne arranged the marriage between her eldest daughter, Elizabeth, and the Earl's eldest son, James. Among Alice Spencer's daughters, Anne was the only one who was a widow. And it's intriguing, when confronted with the choice of widowhood or to remarry, that Anne, like her mother, chose to remarry and then to arrange a marriage between her daughter and her stepson. Despite the tragic outcome of this union, in the face of widowhood's uncertainties, Anne mirrored her mother's choices. Cynthia Herrop noted that regardless of the state of their relationship, together they could claim ancient lineage, extensive property and court connections. After their wedding, they mainly lived at Font Hill, Gifford in Wiltshire. But unfortunately, this was not Anne's happily ever after. According to the Earl's son, Lord Audley, allegations circulated about Anne's sexual relationships with multiple servants. Rumours hinted at the Earl's plan to disinherit his son, which infuriated Lord Audley. Understandable. He was incensed that Castlehaven allegedly encouraged Audley's wife to have a liaison with the Earl's servant, Henry Skipwith. Later revelations suggested that Castlehaven had approved his wife's rape by a servant. Additionally, there were allegations of the Earl having intimate relationships with both male and female servants, including his footman, Lawrence Fitzpatrick. Anne Stanley would later go on to testify that she had been raped and made a suicide attempt as a result. In 1630, Anne Stanley's stepson and son-in-law James 
accused his father of misusing his inheritance by providing money to his preferred individuals in return for sexual favours. Amid the inquiries, Anne revealed to investigators that her husband had aided his footman in assaulting her, and she disclosed that he regularly engaged in sexual acts with his male favourites. Consequently, the Earl faced trial for charges of rape and sodomy alongside two servants and was ultimately convicted. On the 25th of April 1631, the Earl of Castle Haven's trial took place, during which Anne's testimony was read on her behalf. This was done to save her the embarrassment of addressing the court and to try and preserve her dignity. After all, she was of royal blood. Despite making the charges, the Countess herself did not personally attend the Earl's trial. The judges deliberated on the appropriate procedure for this circumstance and concluded whether it is adjudged when the woman complaineth not presently, and whether there be a necessity of accusation within a convenient time, as within twenty four hours. The judges resolved that in so much as she was fought against her will, and then showed her dislike, she was not limited to any time for her complaint, and that in an indictment there is no limitation of time, but in an appeal there is. The first part of the Countess's testimony recounted the Earl's desire to watch her sleep with other men. She then described the night the Earl and Giles Broadway raped her. That one night, being a bed with her at Font Hill, he called for his man Broadway and commanded him to lie at his bed's feet, and about midnight, she being asleep, called him to light a pipe of tobacco. Broadway rose in his shirt, and my lord pulled him into bed to him and her, and made him lie next to her. Once Broadway climbed into her bed, Broadway lay with her, and knew her carnally, whilst she made resistance, and the lord held both her hands and one of her legs the while. After the assault, as soon as she was free, she would have killed herself with a knife but that Broadway forcibly took the knife from her and broke it, and before that act of Broadway, she had never done it. Broadway's testimony supported Anne's account, although rather interestingly, the 16-year-old Lady Audley also read a statement at the Earl of Castlehaven's trial. Her testimony was not related to either the rape or the sodomy charge. She told of how Castlehaven had arranged for her to take up a sexual relationship with Henry Skipwith, a favourite of the Earl. She claims that she did not want to sleep with Skipwith, but the Earl manipulated her into doing so. When the Earl solicited her, he said that upon his knowledge her husband loved her not, and threatened that he would turn her out of doors if she did not lie with Skipwith, and that if she did not, he would tell her husband she did. However, and I don't want to say this, we may take Lady Audley's testimony with just a little pinch of salt. See, she did not formally charge the Earl or Skipwith with anything, and Skipwith never stood trial, so her testimony seems rather out of place. Castlehaven denied the testimony against him and accused his son, Lord Audley, of plotting against him with Anne and Giles Broadway. However, even more intriguingly, he neither confirmed nor denied the accusations made by his stepdaughter slash daughter-in-law, Lady Audley. Anne's mother, Alice, the Dowager Countess of Derby, pleaded with Secretary Dorchester to ask King Charles I if she could be charged with the care of her daughter Anne, Countess of Castlehaven, until the trials of Broadway and Fitzpatrick were over, which were to occur on the 27th of June. In the letter she expressed her desire for her granddaughter and Lord Audley to reconcile, and the need for an eventual pardon for both her daughter and granddaughter. The Dowager Countess wrote to Secretary Dorchester that her hope was that neither my daughter nor Lady Audley, 
will ever offend either God or his majesty again by their wicked curses, but redeem what is past by their reformation and newness of life. Newness of life. After hearing both sides, the jurors were unanimous. The Earl of Castlehaven was found guilty. The jurors believed that the Earl was driven by lust, one of the seven deadly sins. He was to be hanged. The Countess of Castlehaven's testimony mentions nothing about her husband's sexual relationships with other men. She, therefore, did not play an extensive role in the Earl's guilty verdict on this charge. Nor did she testify against Lawrence Fitzpatrick at his joint trial with Giles Broadway. The Earl's family were furious and they flooded King Charles I with petitions. In one they prayed him, the King, to examine those persons upon whose testimonies the Earl had been adjudged to die. However, on the 7th of May 1631, King Charles I decreed that the verdict would be upheld. However, as the Earl of Castlehaven had noble ancestry, he allowed the Earl the more merciful death of beheading. On the 10th of May, the Earl's brother-in-law, Sir Archibald Douglas, once more appealed to the King, urging him to reassess the Earl's punishment. Douglas claimed that the Countess of Castlehaven was unreliable and had plotted against her husband. However, his appeals had no effect on the outcome. The Earl of Castlehaven was still to be beheaded. The Earl of Castlehaven was beheaded on the 14th of May, 1631. After the execution, Anne, now the Dowager Countess of Castlehaven, spent most of her days removed from public life only appearing briefly for the trial of Giles Broadway and Lawrence Fitzpatrick. Although the verdict had not yet been made, the Earl had already been executed, so it was expected that by the time the trial finished, they would probably be found guilty and executed as well, which they were. Both men were beheaded on the 6th of July. 1631. On the scaffold, Broadway accused Anne of having murdered her own child and being the wickedest woman in the world. On the 21st of May 1631, Alice Spencer wrote to the King, expressing her stance that she wouldn't welcome either of the women, her daughter and granddaughter, into her home until they obtained royal pardons. Despite Alice's wish to reconcile her granddaughter, and Lord Audley's marriage, their hopes were dashed in June 1631, when an agreement was reached. This deal ensured that the young Lord Touche would provide his estranged wife with an annual payment of £300 for life, instead of ever reuniting with her. This arrangement aimed to safeguard her daughter's affairs. Additionally, Alice committed to paying Anne £200 per annum for life. Alice made it explicitly clear that she wouldn't receive Anne or Elizabeth into her home until they received pardons. Her actions were aimed at securing any possible support for them, not reproaching them. Alice was successful in her task of securing pardons for her family on the 14th of November 1631. Anne and her children relocated to Harefield House where the Countess of Derby played a pivotal role in their lives. While accepting her daughter and granddaughter into her home, the Countess of Derby expected them to lead quiet, secluded and modest lives. Despite the disgrace from the Castlehaven trial, she ensured her other Bridges grandchildren maintained respectable and ordinary lives. During Anne's tumultuous second marriage, and the subsequent breakdown of her reputation and family, she didn't face these challenges alone. Her mother played a significant role in both the trial and the king's actions in the months following. The Dowager Countess of Derby had never endorsed her eldest daughter's choice of a second husband. However, when Anne's household started unravelling, Alice did not turn her back on her. In 1633, the Earl of Castlehaven's sister, Eleanor Davis circulated her pamphlet titled Woe to the House. 
The house she is referring to is the House of Stanley, and in this pamphlet she essentially calls Anne a Jezebel. This pamphlet would be the first of four that defends the innocence of her brother, the Earl of Castlehaven. Anne's younger sister Elizabeth Stanley, Countess of Huntingdon, died on the 20th of January 1634 of what we think was uterine cancer in Whitefriars at the home of their sister Frances, Countess of Bridgewater. The Stanley seemed to be a close-knit family and imagine her death was devastating for them, especially their mother Alice, as no parent wants to see their child go before them. Elizabeth's funeral was on the 9th of February. On the 29th of September 1634, the Bridgewater family, accompanied by their close circle of friends and relatives, assembled at Ludlow Castle, the official residence of the President of the Marshes of Wales. We can assume that Anne was among the friends and family that were present. Here John Milton presented his mask, Comus, for the first time. The narrative revolves around a young girl who becomes separated from her brothers while strolling through the woods. Encountering Comus, a malevolent demon, she faces temptation as he seeks to deprive her of her virtue in his lair. Despite his allure, the girl resists, preserving her purity. Ultimately, she reunites with her brothers and safely returns home. Milton crafted this mask in honour of the Earl of Bridgewater's appointment. Notably, the Bridgewater family's youngest children took on the principal roles with Lady Alice Egerton portraying the Virgin and her brothers John and Thomas playing the roles of her siblings. Alice Spencer, Dowager Countess of Derby, was the only member of the family to publicly talk about the Castle Haven scandal. She had never liked her daughter's choice of second husband, and less than a year before the trial, she had written to her daughter Frances about the Earl's character. I am sometimes from home at your house, which I am building to set it forward, that if it should please God to call for me, I might have a place to lay my stuff in out of my Lord Castlehaven's fingering. Clearly, she viewed her son-in-law as a shady character who should not be trusted. In 1635, Anne's daughter Frances married Edward Fortescue, and it was believed that the Earl of Huntingdon had entertained Lady Eleanor. Alice Spencer did not take very kindly to her son-in-law entertaining the woman who had been slandering her family. Alice was to lose another child on the 11th of March 1636, when Frances, Countess of Bridgewater, died at the age of 52. Anne Stanley was now the last of her mother's children. In January 1637, Anne Stanley, Countess of Castlehaven, became the last survivor of her family when her mother Alice Spencer died at the age of 77. Alice had died a widow and diverged social norms by not being buried near any of her husbands. Against societal and financial norms, the Countess of Derby disregarded any constraints when expressing her mourning desires. Her insistence on outfitting her servants and immediate family in black attire formed a group of mourners embodying her traditional yet personally crafted sense of grandeur. Once more, the rural queen orchestrated an opulent and lavish Elizabethan funeral procession to be conducted in Harefield, a testament to her extravagant wishes. I just want to state before somebody in the comment section misunderstands, I am aware that it is no longer the Elizabethan era on the basis that Elizabeth has now been dead for about three decades and England is now being ruled by a Stuart monarch. What I am saying is that she had an Elizabethan funeral. Okay, okay. The 14th of December 1637 witnessed the union of George, the son of Anne Stanley, and Susan, the daughter of Henry Montagu, the first Earl of Manchester. In 1644, Lady Eleanor Davis launched her second attack on the House of Stanley, with the publication of The Word of God to the City of London. At that time, the Countesses of Derby, Bridgewater and Huntingdon 
had all passed away. Anne resided in almost complete seclusion at Hayden House in Ruslip. In her pamphlet, Lady Eleanor detailed her perspective on the accusations, the trial, and the wrongful outcome. She wrote on her brother's behalf, affirming for that fact whereof the Earl of Castlehaven was accused by his wife, such a wicked woman, and how the Lord slew them both. Lady Eleanor argues that the Countess's accusation of re misrepresented reality. The Countess was the whore. Lady Eleanor, like her brother, argued that sex, not re had taken place. Anne Stanley, the Queen of the Cotswolds and Countess of Castlehaven, died at the age of 67 in October 1647. Unfortunately for the Countess of Castlehaven, upon her passing, discussions surrounding her virtue or honour were unlikely. Anne seemingly continued to reside at Hayden House until her demise, after which her body was transported to Harefield House for burial. After 1637, there is no surviving documentation about her life and death. The exact location of Anne's grave remains a mystery. The Countess of Castlehaven had no mother, no sisters or husband to grieve for her. Records indicate she was survived by her eldest daughter, Elizabeth, and two sons, George and William, while details about her two younger daughters, Anne and Frances, remain unknown. Despite their mother's tragic fate, Anne's sons seem to have carved a respectable career for themselves. Following the Castlehaven trial, Elizabeth vanished from historical records, following a path similar to her mother. What I think makes the trial of the Earl of Castlehaven so fascinating is the fact that the court permitted the Countess to testify against her husband. Sarah Mendelssohn and Patricia Crawford have argued that cases of marital rape could not be legally sustained, since neither husband nor wife could testify against each other in court. A wife could not complain against certain actions of her husband. I believe that the Castlehaven trial is, although not the first, is the big event that helps buck the societal trend. Laura Going's research on trials in early modern England highlights a significant rise in the count of female plaintiffs throughout the 17th century. Going's findings reveal a remarkable shift. In 1570, merely 30% of all plaintiffs in London courts were women. But this proportion surged to 70% between 1630 and 1639, and the Castlehaven trial took place in 1631, right at the start of that range going provided. Initially, one of the striking irregularities with the Castlehaven scandal was the circumstance of a wife pressing charges against her husband. The court deemed it acceptable, as the Countess of Castlehaven was the direct victim of a crime. She advocated for herself, and not on behalf of another. During the proceedings, the Earl and Giles Broadway contended that Broadway ejaculated on the Countess instead of engaging in penetration. Disputing this assertion, the Countess disagreed with their account. Subsequently, the Earl questions the possibility of being charged with rape if penetration didn't occur. <laughs> By allowing the Countess of Castlehaven to testify against her husband, the court momentarily disrupted the structured patriarchal norms of society, but the imperative to reinstate this order remained. Granting pardon to the Countess and her daughter served this purpose. Cynthia Herrop believes that the Earl's connections to Ireland and Catholicism might have contributed to the jurors' unfavourable disposition towards him. This sentiment potentially indicated a predisposition in favour of the Countess from the outset. If the jurors viewed the Earl as an outsider whose conduct disrupted English standards of order and acceptability, 
they might have seen the Countess as a figure needing protection, giving her association with something deemed worthy of safeguarding. The jurors were more than aware of her esteemed royal lineage. Disregarding the Countess of Castlehaven's illustrious family lineage would not be in the jurors' favour, as doing so would entail neglecting their own impressive pedigrees. Birth and close familial connections tied the Countess and her daughter to ten of the jurors. On Anne Stanley's side, she shared familial ties with four jurors. Lord Strange and the Countess of Castlehaven were first cousins. Additionally, the Countess had distant relations with the Earl of Arundel and Lord Clifford. On her Stanley side, among others, notably her great-great-great-grandfather was, of course, King Henry VII. In addition to these personal connections, there were other factors that might have inclined the jurors to take the Countess more seriously compared to other women of the 17th century, who accused someone of rape. Her age, in particular, would have significantly influenced the jurors' perspective. At the time of the incident in 1631, the Countess was 51 years old. Laura Going argues that the ability to defend oneself against unwanted touch was bound to be partly dependent on age, marital status and social position. The general belief was that older, more established women had less incentive for false accusations of rape, given their already established status in society. Additionally, in this trial, the fact that the Countess was 13 years older than the Earl held particular significance. And that's where I'm going to leave today's video. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to like and subscribe, and if you'd like to support me and this channel, then you can do so with a super thanks, as working a full-time job on top of this can be very stressful at times. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe with the notification bell turned on, and I will see you in the next one. And as always, have a wonderful day.